Hi, everyone. Welcome to our Smartman Spotlight. I'm Tammy Minershagen. I'm the Executive Director of Frisco Arts, and we have a really special program in store for you. I um, wanted to give thanks to Anthony Barocas. He is our live stream producer today with Stream4.us. Uh, you contact him if you're interested in live streaming, which is kind of our new normal now uh, in this environment. So if you're new to Frisco Arts, we are arts advocacy, and we like to show what people are doing in the art sector, remarkable things. Uh, and you know, when you think about it, why do we do this? Why do we want to spotlight the arts? Um, well, the arts are very, very important. I mean, they're what makes us human. They inspire us, they connect us, they refresh us. And especially during these difficult times, we really believe in this statement by George Bernard Shaw that without art, the crudeness of reality would make the world unbearable. So today we will discuss this in a very unique way um, with Robert M. Edsel. He is the number one New York Times bestselling author of The Monuments Men. He's actually had many different careers from being a nationally ranked tennis to building a leading oil and gas exploration business uh, and being an author of many different books. And this particular one, The Monuments Men, has been translated into over 30 languages and was the basis for the movie, The Monuments Men, which was written and directed by and starring Academy Award winner George Clooney and had an incredible cast, Matt Damon, Bill Murray, Kate Blanchett, and others. If you haven't seen the movie, <coughs> I highly recommend it. So we just celebrated Memorial Day as a country, honoring those who gave their lives for our freedom. And it's very timely for us to get a chance to focus on the men and women who served our country during World War II, and specifically shed light on those in the monuments, fine arts, and archives section of the Allies during World War II. They are simply called the Monuments Men. So these heroes were a group of 345 American and British men and women museum curators, art historians, librarians, architects, even artists, responsible for hunting down and recovering cultural masterpieces stolen by the Nazis. Robert's work in preserving their incredible story through his writing and by forming the Monuments Men Foundation for the Preservation of Art has resulted in numerous honors, including the National Humanities Medal, America's highest honor for work in the humanities, presented to Robert by President George Bush in 2007 at a White House ceremony. Robert also received the Records of Achievement Award by the Foundation for the National Archives in recognition of his outstanding work bringing to life the story of the Monuments Men. Past recipients of the Records of Achievement Award include Laura Bush, Tom Hanks, Steven Spielberg, Lin-Manuel Miranda, and others. So before we bring Robert on with us, we want to share a five minute video that was created by the Foundation for the National Archives in honor of Robert's award. If you're unfamiliar with Robert and his work, this will help give you some background for our discussion today. I think for a lot of people, history starts with their personal lives, and it's talking to a grandparent who has a story to tell, and having that grandparent's story lead you to a wider understanding of what was going on in history. And in Robert's case, I think he loved art and he became interested in the Monuments Men. I mean, just follow those threads, pull those threads, because we're all connected uh, in one way or another. And it's really through learning our shared history, our common history, that we understand our shared humanity. Robert is a person with an amazing amount of energy, an amazing amount of passion and dedication and devotion. He's been a very, very successful person, but he's taken that success and he has given back and he has allowed the light to shine on other people. I mean, that's exactly the kind of person we love to honor with our Records of Achievement Award. A person who cares about history, who's used the records of the National Archives, and who cares so much about the stories of others that he's willing to share them. Uh, about 11 years ago, I was walking across this bridge, the Ponte Vecchio here in Florence, and looking over my shoulder at the Ponte Santa Trinita, and it occurred to me how all these great works of art, all these fantastic monuments throughout Europe had survived the most destructive conflict man's ever known, World War II. All over the world, the walls are tumbling down, for well, this is the battle for the world, the battle for a world free from war. 
a world free from the fear of tumbling walls. The prize thief among the high Nazis was Hermann Goering, who looted museums and private collections in all parts of Europe. Much was hidden in caves, and advancing troops captured fully laden freight cars, ready to move much of the collection to safer places. One of the, the terrible, terrible um, aspects of war that doesn't always get a, a lot of attention is the intentional destruction of uh, a society's culture as a way of penalizing the enemy. Artwork and cultural artifacts oftentimes sort of measure human progress. They're markers for us sort of in the longer arc of history. When we lose these things, when they're damaged, when they're destroyed, it doesn't matter what country they're in. They belong to everybody. They're part of our shared cultural heritage. And when that art is stolen or when that art is destroyed, it really destroys the soul of a people. I think what's really extraordinary is after Europeans saw the total destruction of Warsaw, Poland in particular, you had a country like France completely evacuate their major museums. But the Nazis were tracking where everything was going and oftentimes were able to get these items even if they were removed from the major national museums. We, instead of stealing things, were involved in returning things to the rightful owner. Some things that uh, we should be damn proud of. So many of the famous paintings and sculptures that really we take for granted now uh, are still available to us because of the work of the Monuments Men. And Robert Etzel has really made their story come alive. Robert Etzel saw to it that a documentary was made and the books. Then of course over here he talked uh, George Clooney into making the movie. His work, both through the foundation and through the book, which became a motion picture, is helping people reassess the ownership of these pieces of artwork. I think anytime you put a story in film, I think you, you reach a broader audience. What pleases me about this film is that it's accurate. Robert has not only done research here and used that research to write books and do films, Robert has also donated actual documents and photo albums to the National Archives. Not only have I relied on the archives, we've also found a number of historically important documents that were not at the archives that individuals had, in some cases American veterans, that brought these things home as souvenirs having no idea about their importance. And it was important to me to see that they have a proper home. I think when Robert began to understand the importance of the art and the importance of the individuals who had saved the art, in some ways this became a selfless mission of his. He's devoted himself to helping to find uh, these missing pieces of, of art and artifacts and to bring them back to their rightful owners. It was about Robert shining a light on these men and women who had worked so hard to make sure that this art was preserved, that this art was rescued. He wanted to make sure that their story didn't get lost. We learned so much from the people who use the collection that many of the discoveries that are made are made by researchers. One of the things that I, I hope is a takeaway from my experience, in particular for younger people, is the enormous treasure chest of information that's at the National Archives. So every time I walk into those big brass doors, I realize that the story of America is here in these walls. And those are stories yet to be told. Wow, what an amazing uh, video. And we have Robert with us right now. Welcome, Robert, and thanks for being with us today. Great to be with you, Tammy. Um, we have everyone watching on Facebook Live, so if you have questions or comments, feel free to write them in. I've got my phone in front of me, so we'll try to address them along the way. Um, but I am ready to dive in. So uh, the story of the Monuments Men is full of suspense, drama, action, uh, and uh, it's incredible to me that it actually really all happened. 
Uh, if you can give us a little more historical context about uh, Hitler and his fascination about the art and why, what was his motivation to be stealing art during World War II? Hitler had an ambition to be seen as a, a talented artist and architect, and he had studied that as a young boy. Uh, he was rejected by the Academy of Fine Arts in Vienna as not having enough talent. And this was something that stayed with him his entire life. In fact, he, he felt that uh, the jurors who had reached this decision were Jews, even though not all of them were, many were. But he almost wagged his finger at them and said, you know, I'll, uh, I'm going to get you. And in the course of time, with his rise to leadership, he used art as a weapon of propaganda to show what he considered was degenerate art, art by great artists like Picasso and Van Gogh, Matisse, artists that Hitler believed couldn't see nature as it existed and therefore there was something uh, defective about them and he didn't want to foul, have their works foul the mind of the German people. There were other works that were German painters and Austrian painters who were not appreciated in his view and those represented this idealistic Ubermann, uh, this almost Superman type German figure, the Aryan race that he was constantly promoting. So in the, as he established power and made this faithful visit to Florence in 1938, when he, for the very first time, saw these great museums, the Uffizi, the Pitti Palace, the Bargello and others, and realized what was possible, what the uh, collecting families and rulers had, had assembled over hundreds of years, he returned to Berlin and started drawings with his own hand of this new cultural complex that was going to be in his hometown of Linz, Austria. And at the center of the complex was going to be the Fuhrer Museum, one of the great museums of the world that contained works of art that he believed were the overlooked great artists, some accomplished, uh, old master painters like Leonardo da Vinci, Michelangelo and others, but also many of the German and Austrian painters who he had great affection for. Of course, he had a problem. So many of the works of art were already in museums. They were in private collections, but this was a minor problem that he was prepared to address in the course of conquering these countries throughout Europe. Wow. So a failed artist who really, I mean, that stayed with him and it, it became a vendetta in, in a way. Um, gosh. It was, but so, it was also a passion. I mean, there's no question that it, it wasn't just... Um, I think he felt slighted. Uh, it was, mm -hmm. you know, we oftentimes as we get older forget what it was like to be young, what it was like to be convinced that you were good at something and this sense of passion that you have for it. And then when you're rejected, um, you know, it, it's a deeply wounding experience that most people work their way through. They learn from it. They make adjustments. Maybe they realize they don't have that talent. Maybe they redouble their efforts and prove to people that they do. Now, in Hitler's case, it took on a lethality that's even hard for us to get our, our head around today. But it wasn't just a matter of retribution. He genuinely loved art. He didn't care about the people of Germany. He didn't care about the children. Uh, in the final days of the war, issued orders, the uh, Nero order, they called it, to basically gut the country and slow down or impede the Allied advance. And there were people around him that said, this is going to be the death knell for German people. And his view was, we're the weaker race. This is what we deserve. I don't care about them. Mm -hmm. And yet he was dictating his will, making specific provisions to save the works of art he'd accumulated over the course of time. So it takes on a very sick aspect in the late stages of the war. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So when President Roosevelt found out about this um, and he put together this Monuments Men group, tell us about this group of men and women and you know what were their backgrounds and they were not your typical soldiers. No, they weren't. In fact, some later referred to them as scholar soldiers, which is pretty accurate. Um, the, the creation of this Monuments, Fine Arts and Archives group is a consequence of the guy there that you're looking at, the second guy from the right, George Stout, who was a great conservator of works of art at Harvard, at the Fogg Museum at Harvard. And Stout was old enough, he'd actually fought the last year of World War I. So he had a great understanding of the devastation of war. And of course, after World War I, by the time World War II comes around, there's been unbelievable techno technological developments in warfare, not the least of which is aerial bombing and the fires that they caused. 
And George Stout was convinced there was going to be a Second World War uh, long before Pearl Harbor. Uh, he watched with great horror the damage that was taking place in Spain with their Spanish Civil War in 1936-37 and started preparing pamphlets for how to better protect works of art during times of conflict uh, based on what he was seeing. And so he was ready by the time of Pearl Harbor. And he made the argument that it wasn't just a uh, um, responsibility, but it was a duty of the United States to protect cultural treasures as much as war allowed. Um, and he had the not only a passion for it, but he'd done the science behind it, was able to explain this. And it was his idea more than any other that worked its way to President Roosevelt's desk. And Roosevelt, I think, saw the imminent logic of it, but he also, I think, had an acute understanding the Nazis were outstanding with propaganda and they were pummeling the United States that can, trying to convince people in Europe that the landing forces in North Africa and then in Italy and ultimately in the western part of France, uh, British American troops and others were there to loot Europe. They were there to steal people's treasures. And there were many people that believed this. And it was important to have these monuments, men and women, uh, they were museum directors, curators, art historians, architects, some were artists themselves, some were librarians who volunteered for service, average age in their uh, early 40s. Most of them uh, were married. Some had kids. They all had accomplished careers and they walked away from it to put on a military uniform and go into harm's way. And in fact, two monuments officers were killed during combat, something we uh, pay particular attention to as we have just now crossed over another Memorial Day, the 75th uh, Memorial Day since World War II. So it's an, an enormous departure, um, a, a sea change in the development of civilization that for the first time an army was fighting a war and at the same time trying to mitigate damage to cultural treasures. These monuments, men and women were advising military commanders on how to steer bombing away from cultural targets to minimize damage. When they got boots on the ground, they were affecting temporary repairs to churches and other buildings. And then in the later stages of the war, when the magnitude of what was the greatest theft in history became known, they became art detectives trying to track down and find millions, millions of stolen cultural objects taken by German forces, such as this painting that was stolen from a museum in Italy. Well, and I mean, that's what we wanna go into as uh, some of these wonderful, incredible snapshots of these masterpieces found in mines and on top of curtains. Uh, so first of all, um, how, how did they track where these were? I and mean, how, how did they find them? And then how did they transport them? Because some of these are huge and weighing tons um, what were the logistics behind all of that? It's a great point that you make. And, you know, any, anyone that's a viewer, whether you've been in the military or not, you can pretty well start to get a sense when you think about millions of cultural objects being stolen, being moved around, transported over rail, transported on trucks, people carrying these things, people building crates, having them moved on multiple occasions, hiding them in salt mines and caves and castles, uh, monasteries. How much time did that take? How many people were involved? How much money did it consume? How much resources were dedicated to this? And what might have happened in the war had Hitler not had this fascination with works of art and all of those resources and time and attention and money and planes and trains had been devoted to prosecuting the war? What might have happened? So the, the answer to your question, the, the uh, packing up of Europe and their cultural treasures begins in 1939 when the Nazis invade Poland. The alarm bell goes off throughout Europe. All the major museums uh, pack up and evacuate works of art to get them out of the cities. Again, the fear being that bombing, Allied bombing, is going to cause fires that are the ultimate danger to works of art. The Louvre is an example in Paris, packed up 400,000 objects in a matter of 10 days. Now, Think about that. We'd have attorneys arguing for 10 days today to figure out who's going to do what to whom. So the emergency allowed for seemingly miraculous events to take place. You see this sculpture by Michelangelo of Moses 
in a church in Rome that's been bricked up or is being bricked up to try and protect it in case a bomb hits the ceiling of the church and it collapses. The same happened with the David. The same took place with Leonardo da Vinci's Last Supper. So works of art that could be moved were packed up and put on trucks or barges. Uh, works of art that couldn't be moved were, as you saw in that sculpture by Michelangelo, uh, tr they attempted to protect them in those places. Many of the works of art, like the Mona Lisa, were moved on multiple occasions. The Mona Lisa was actually moved six times before it returned to Paris in 1945. At one point in time, it was in a crate underneath a 12-year-old's bed in a country house well outside Paris. Uh, it was the only work of art in this chateau, but they felt it was a safe place. She told a beautiful story about how she periodically at night uh, with a flashlight pull the crate out and uh, lift up the latches, open it up, and there'd be this red velour interior, and there was uh, Mona Lisa smiling back at her. So in, just incredible stories, in particular when we think about the fact that everybody's been to museums and we've all had some overzealous um, curator or guard come over and tell us, don't point, don't use flash photography, and you know, you should listen to them. But at the same point in time, these things are pretty remarkably durable. I mean, as you see in these photographs, no crates sitting on the floor, sometimes on the floor of salt mines, being moved around. Here's a photo of General Eisenhower, General Patton looking over his shoulder, General uh, Bradley on the left side of the photograph, General Eddy in the background, some 14 stars between these four generals uh, who have descended into a salt mine uh, more than 2,500 feet deep where there were tens of thousands of works of art that belong to the Berlin museums that have been evacuated at the last minute to try and keep them safe from, from destruction. So it wasn't always, the works of art that were being found weren't always stolen. Sometimes they were the works of art that belonged to German museums because the whole process by that late stage of the war was being run in reverse. Wow, um, as you look at these photos, I mean, it's just absolutely remarkable to see the juxtaposition of these works of art underground. The salt mine um, that was uh, in Austria didn't, tell us a little bit more about that, what was found in there and how they were trying to make sure no one could access it after, you know, once they had to give up. Right, well, there's a, there's a salt mine in, uh, in Altause. It's a small lakeside, um, I mean, it's not even a town. There's just a few people that live there. It's about 45 minutes uh, near Salzburg, Austria. Um, you can still visit it today. I, uh, through the Monuments Men Foundation, we, we conduct trips, uh, in the footsteps trips, where we take people on tours of where the Monuments Men were, including visiting uh, several of the salt mines and other places things were hidden. And um, it, it was uh, the kind of the last, it was the Alamo, if you will, the last vestige of hiding for the works of art that were mostly were uh, destined for Hitler's Führer Museum. There were, uh, they were hidden uh, in late 44, early 45. They commandeered this salt mine. This mine isn't a vertical mine as much as it is horizontal. It just goes back for, for hundreds of miles in different directions and labyrinths. And they'd hollowed out uh, some of the areas of the mines two or three stories high and had built uh, wooden platforms on the ground and built racks and crates to hold these works of art. And we'd speak not of minor works of art, things like the Ginn altarpiece, which is the most important uh, altar panel in the world, stolen from uh, Belgium. The um, Bruges Madonna by uh, Michelangelo, which had been uh, stolen from a church in Bruges, Belgium, and it had uh, been hidden there and works by Vermeer, Rembrandt, Leonardo, Michelangelo. I mean, the list is just endless. The who's who of, of the, the reasons that we go to Europe to, to see these things. That's where they were. And this is the photograph inside that mine. You see George Stout, again, the guy who thought of this uh, at the top of the photo with the helmet on, looking, uh, flipping through these racks of pictures, trying to see what's there. In the uh, last few days of the war, one of the German, uh, one of the Austrian, um, Gauleiters, uh, district mayor, if you will, was determined that he knew what Hitler wanted and that he that Hitler would have wanted these things destroyed. In other words, if the Germans weren't going to win the war, then the to the victors uh, there would be nothing left. So he planted eight different 500-pound uh, bombs in crates that were marked fragile marble 
do not move, trying to deceive the miners into thinking that they were other works of art and they were placed in strategic places to the mine and had every intention of destroying all of these things. So there are, there's not a museum that we go to today to see things like this uh, self-portrait by Rembrandt that you're looking at that uh, would be missing, they'd be gone. We'd be looking at a photograph of them, a black and white photo more than likely in some history book because the work of art would have been destroyed. The miners got wind of this guy's plan. They uh, removed the uh, bombs and set off small charges in the passageways to create the impression that the bombs had been detonated and also to block the passage so that other fanatic German Nazis couldn't get in there to uh, put other devices. Of course, their concern wasn't entirely altruistic. This was their source of income. This is where they made their living. So they didn't want to see the mines utterly destroyed. Uh, and the Monuments Men arrived literally um, within a day or so of all of this taking place and uh, thought their worst fears were realized. They uh, pulled up and realized that they couldn't get through these passageways and they thought, uh, in fact, all these things have been destroyed. And so they burrowed their way over the top of these mounds of rubble, not knowing what they were gonna see when they got to the other side, fearful that the mines had been flooded and all the works of art would have been destroyed. And uh, in fact, with the uh, thin lighting of miners' lamps had discovered, in essence, Aladdin's cave. Um, works of art, I mentioned the Gen altarpiece, here's the central panel, and remarkably you see some of the other panels sitting on milk cartons and ledges behind the miner in the foreground and monuments man uh, Daniel Kern uh, going through looking at these, these uh, really priceless works of art that define Western civilization's development over the last 500 years. Truly, truly remarkable. I know that uh, people watching right now, their jaws are on the floor <laughs> seeing these photos and learning about the story. We had a question come in about uh, your research process. And I know that you did have an opportunity to actually interview 21 Monuments Men. Can you tell us um, maybe a couple of the, the folks that you talked with that really made an impression on you or stories? That you could sure. share. Um, in fact, in the course of my work, I've interviewed uh, three monuments women, uh, let's see, 18 monuments men. Uh, most of them have been American. There were a couple British and uh, hundreds of their family members, uh, kids my age and so on. And I don't know how many other friends or colleagues, soldiers that were there and so on. So yes, each one of these monuments men became dear friends some were quite ill. Uh, George Stout uh, died in 1978. I didn't have a chance to meet him, but I spent a lot of time with his son, Tom. Um, I learned from each of them um, about what their history was. And I heard things like, you know, we came home and we didn't talk about it because we couldn't talk about it. Um, we, we made a mistake. We should have talked about it. It was important that people know what we did not because of, of who we were, but the importance of the effort to preserve these works of art. They felt, as all World War II veterans do feel today, that the real heroes uh, aren't those that are still with us. They're the men and women that didn't come home, that are still in Europe, uh, buried in some of the American military cemeteries there. And so they were, uh, people just wanted to come back and get back on with their lives. They didn't want to come home and talk about the things that they'd seen, the, the horrors of war. Um, and it was it, that part was unfortunate. And that's why we've heard, had World War II veterans so much over the last 20 years, I think, come to the realization that the world and our country in particular need to know what they went through and the sacrifices and the hardships and the losses and why it all mattered to them to do that. And it's why they are talking more. And of course, so much of their stories are captivated brilliantly at the National World War II Museum in New Orleans. Um, a museum I've served on the board and, and uh, that is currently building their liberation pavilion that will house a permanent exhibition for the Monuments Men. Um, and it's going to be very, very exciting to see their story captivated. The Monuments Officer who um, I was closest to was Harry Etlinger, who died two years ago in December. A great fellow. Uh, he was 92 years old, one of the great American success stories ever. And by that, I mean he was born a German Jew. 
He was the last Jew to have a bar mitzvah in the German town of Karlsruhe before Kristallnacht, um, when the Nazis uh, really targeted and went after Jewish businesses and Jews specifically. There were uh, fires set throughout the country, broken glass, night of broken glass, that's what Kristallnacht means. And his family fled to the United States. He arrived, he was 13 years old. He didn't speak any English. He went to a public school and worked two jobs from the time he was 13. At 18, he was drafted in the American army. Um, his drill sergeant said, Etlinger, are you an American? And he said, no, sir, I'm a German Jew. And he said, well, we're gonna fix that right now. And they, they uh, had a, a naturalization ceremony for him that afternoon in front of the justice of the peace. And he was put on an American army uniform and went back to the country of his birth to fight a country for his new country. So, you know, Harry Etling was a remarkable, remarkable guy. He was unlike most of the monuments men, he was extremely young, but he was a native German speaker. And that's what they needed as they were covering, uncovering uh, tens of thousands of documents. They needed to be looking at these documents for clues about where the missing works of art had been hidden. And that was the role that Harry played. So he was a particularly uh, close friend and it, we, we mourn his loss to this day. He was a great guy, lived a fantastic life. The other monuments man, um, that made a big impression on me was Lane Faison. Lane was um, in the OSS. His job at the end of the war was to try and decipher what Hitler's intentions were and figure out where a lot of the works of art still were. He was the last monuments man to leave Europe in 1951, a legendary professor of art at uh, Williams College. And uh, Lane uh, was 98 when I met him. We spent more, almost four hours visiting together. And those who have read my book know I made a particular point of telling the story of seeing him. And it was, that's when I had this epiphany about the importance of writing the narrative story about these men and women's records. Um, and he really was the one that did it. He, he um, in some ways conveyed to me that it was a passing of the torch, that they were counting on me doing this. And I felt this sense of obligation and and joy over trying to gather these stories and tell them. When I started, uh, we had to find all these people. There were only about five or six that we knew of. And then over the course of time, kept finding another one here and another one there. And great joy over the last few years to find these monuments, women who are equally remarkable and will be the subject of future stories I'll be telling. It's, it's just beautiful, beautiful stories. And I, I kind of did a little more research on you and the moments that you got to meet with them um, and that passing the torch, I mean, that must have been very, very meaningful for you. Uh, and and one of them, I think it was Faison that said, you know, he's been waiting to meet you all his life. And I teared up just reading about that moment. Um, so, you know, keeping these stories alive. And as you mentioned, Ma Monuments women as well were involved. And we just recently uh, lost one of them. Um, can mm -hmm. you tell us a little bit about her? Yeah, Motoko Fujishiro Huthwaite. Uh, Motoko was a um, monuments woman. And, you know, when we, a lot of times people want to know what, what a monuments officer did during the war. And if they hear that they were there in a clerk capacity or secretarial or after the war, you know, then they, I don't know, you see kind of a deflation on their part because nobody was shooting at them or there wasn't a danger. Well, you know, people that go into military, um, they're supposed to behave entrepreneurially, but they're not entrepreneurs. They get assigned a job and their responsibility is to do the best they can to fulfill that job. They don't pick the jobs usually, more so today than say during war, but uh, Motoko has an incredible story and it's why she's one of the key figures that I'll be writing about in the future. She was a 14 year old girl in Boston. Her father had, was, a, was Japanese, her mother was Japanese. They immigrated to the United States in the 1920s and 30s. Uh, she was born in uh, Boston and lived in Cambridge. Her father was a professor of dentistry at Harvard, very accomplished man. Um, and she answered the phone one afternoon on a, a cold December day in 1941. And that's how she found out about Pearl Harbor. And she was actually the one that uh, shared the news with her father and her mother and they were mortified because they realized 
that the problems that their family was getting ready to endure being Japanese. And in fact, um, the FBI investigated their family. They uh, very wrongly incarcerated her father under accusations of treason. She, her brother and her mother were shipped to Japan and they to Tokyo in 1942. And they uh, survived the devastation of Tokyo, the firebombing that took place. And her father was uh, placed in an internment camp for uh, about a year before he was returned to Japan. But he was a devastated man when he returned. He was uh, basically uh, destroyed as a result of what had taken place. And um, Motoko, when she was 17 at the end of the war, because their family had so many friends in the Boston Cambridge area, one of the monuments men uh, made a point of finding her family, uh, knowing that they were somewhere in Tokyo, and then uh, reminded her that notwithstanding all that had happened, she was still an American citizen. She was because she was born there. And there was this new group called Monuments, Fine Arts and Archives section being set up by a guy named George Stout, the same guy who got it established in Europe then went to Japan and set up the operation there. It was much smaller, but he was the, the linchpin and she was his secretary. Uh, she didn't know that much about art. She was a young, young girl, but she spoke Japanese and, and English, of course, was her native language and she was trusted. And that was an enormously valuable asset for them at that early time in Japan, trying to sort through stolen works of art and protect the cultural treasures of that country. So she went on to do many remarkable things in the course of her life, not the least of which was working her way back to the United States to attend Radcliffe, which was her childhood dream. Uh, she became a, a, a PhD professor, a, an educator, a teacher. She loved teaching fourth grade um, and just lived a remarkable life. And here you see a photograph of her and three of the other monuments officers from 2015 when they received the Congressional Gold Medal, our nation's highest civilian honor uh, for the, the work of the monuments, men and women of all 14 nations. And it was such a happy moment for all of us to see them get this recognition and, and Motoko in particular, to see her be recognized for the things that she'd done. Mm -hmm. I'm just, uh, it's just an amazing, amazing story. It keeps, it's like, yeah. it continues to unravel. And then you have the, the layer of, um, being, uh, Japanese in the middle of this. And then I know even Harry to be a Jew, but then coming to the States and then going back. Uh, so, you know, all of us are working towards the same goal once we are on the same team. And I think that's an important message too, that it really didn't matter um, that she was a woman or that she was Japanese, but she was still doing, she was fulfilling this mission. No, the, you know, the, 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 the point of getting these diverse experiences and diverse people isn't to check boxes on the, um, a corporate scorecard or for um, uh, politically correct points. It's the fact that truly when you have men and women and black and brown and other countries and different languages and foreign religions all working towards a common goal, you're going to end up with the best result because you've got the most diverse contribution of experiences, life experiences, opinions, and so on. And of course, then comes the critical component, which is leadership. And that's the challenge of a leader to not only build this consensus, but also to be able to distill through it and make judgments about what the best path forward is, taking advantage of all that outstanding information and in some cases noise, and then uniting everyone towards a common objective. And uh, those are the challenges that we face today. They're, they are the reason we were so successful during World War II. And much of that um, is a consequence of the outstanding leadership of General Eisenhower and this incredible team of people that he put together. And then their ability and commitment to rely on those people to do their jobs and, and take their counsel. Mm -hmm. And so once you know you you did the research, you wrote the book, and then it was picked up um, by George Clooney, who wanted to create the movie. Um, how accurate did you feel the portrayal was of the film of your book and and 
the well, actual story. Well, the is. overarching principles are, are are correct. And when I first met with George and his uh, his co-writer Grant Hesloff, I told them, "Look, uh, you, I understand this is a different world than the world I live in, where it's got to be accurate and it has to be exactly the way the events took place." Uh, of course, we all know you can still tell an incredibly exciting story. Uh, sticking to the facts. But in Hollywood, they're always going to interject uh, certain interpretations or dramatizations of things. And my view was, as long as you get the overarching elements of the story right, that it was an American and British-led operation, that there were two monuments officers killed in combat, that this had never been done before uh, in the course of civilization. And at the end of the war, instead of keeping these things like the victors have always done, they were returned to the countries from which they were taken, you get all that right. And then, you know, how you mix and match the parts, do whatever is necessary to make it the most exciting story possible. Because my objective was to make sure the most number of people around the world know this story and know who these men and women were and the sacrifices that they went through. So that when we walk into museums and churches and we look at works of art, including works of art in our own cities here in Dallas at the SMU, Meadows Museum, at the Dallas Museum of Art, at the Kimball Art Museum, and so on, there are works of art there that these monuments officers saved. Some of them were in salt mines. Some of them were stolen from Jewish collectors. But there are things, they were among the four million objects the monuments men found and returned. And we don't know to be appreciative of, of how fortuitous those things, uh, that, that we are, that those things survived. So I wanted to make sure that people around the world knew it. And um, you heard David Ferriero, the archivist of the United States, say it earlier, and it's true. Nothing, no medium is more effective delivering a global message than film, and especially when you have a group of actors like this. So the film showed in more than 100 countries. We traveled throughout Europe for the premieres there. You see this photo of us in Milan having this extraordinarily rare honor of filming interviews inside the Santa Maria della Grazia refectory where Leonardo da Vinci's uh, painting Last Supper is on the wall. And um, it was uh, uh, just an enormous success in that respect. Uh, well, it's, you know, it really opened my eyes when I watched the movie because it really, uh, I mean, first of all, I was not familiar with this part of the story. Um, and then to know that this was an actual mission uh, that people were dedicating their lives to and some giving their lives to, uh, it was just incredible. Now, they did find 4 million works of art, but the, it's, it's an unfinished mission because there are still missing pieces. And so tell us a little more about the foundation um, and how you helped to fulfill the mission. In 2007, I founded the Monuments Men Foundation for the Preservation of Art because I was coming across documents that uh, soldiers had brought home during the war thinking they were souvenirs when in fact they were critically important elements of the crime scene. Uh, works of art, uh, paintings, drawings, religious objects, um, and, uh, rare books that soldiers had picked up to come home and just prove to their family, I really was in Hitler's home. I really was in this salt miner cave. And there were rules prohibiting that, but it happened. And our role with the foundation has been to gather these things, to celebrate the fact that these veterans uh, sacrificed so much of their lives to fight this war, that they took care of these things. And I think it really speaks well of Americans in the twilight of their lives coming forward to make sure now that they do realize that they have owners, uh, working with the foundation to make sure that we identify who they are and return them. And you see now on the screen, our toll-free number, one 994 is the the toll-free number, or people can write monumentsmenfoundation.org. And uh, if they have something that was brought home during the war, these things that are cultural treasures, whether they're a document, a work of art, a religious object, they can't be sold. They're, that, that's a violation of our National Stolen Properties Act, uh, and you don't want to go down that road. So we work with families. We don't charge anybody for it, but we ask people to come forward. If they've got something, send us a photograph of it. We perhaps can tell what it is or where it came from. We always want to know about the service history of their family member. It could be someone that was German that immigrated to the United States and brought something with them. But there's still hundreds of thousands of things that are missing, worth billions of dollars. The foundation has found and returned more than 30 such objects to museums in Europe, to individuals. Some of the things have been donated to our National Archives in Washington, D.C. 
and uh, we've got hundreds of leads we're continuing to work on. So this is going to continue for years to come. And so many of these things uh, that are hanging in, uh, on walls and hidden in attics that are in uh, safety deposit boxes, as the World War II generation uh, finishes passing, uh, these things are going to come out and kids our age are going to inherit them. And, you know, we're going to find this last great uh, trove of missing objects. And what you're seeing now are various works of art that we have posted on the Monuments Men Foundation website, our most wanted list of objects. They weren't all old masters. Some include a painting by Van Gogh. Um, uh, this is a, a more modern painting by Paul Clay and Kokoschka. So there's a whole variety of things that are missing and we're constantly on the lookout for it. So that's, that's the ongoing work of the Monuments Men Foundation trying to continue to bring recognition to who these men and women were, tell their stories, and most importantly, identify and uh, return missing works of art and cultural objects to the rightful owners. Um, there's an incredible story about one of them being discovered and returned. Um, it's the vase of flowers. Uh, can you tell yep. us about that and how it, you know, how it unfolded? Well, last year we were very pleased to participate in the return of a painting by Jan van Heysen, who was an important 17th century Dutch painter. He painted these still lives, floral scenes. You see a, a, a photograph there of this uh, painting in remarkable condition that had been missing for 75 years. It was stolen in 1944. Uh, there were two Germans that found a crate that had 10 paintings in it. This was one of them. And the crate was broken and they looked and said, wow, these look like they could be worth something. And in fact, they were. And the paintings disappeared. No one saw them for um, until 1962 when two of the paintings surfaced in Pasadena, California, it, uh, still in the possession of one of the two soldiers. That, and he was attempting to sell them and the, the uh, restorer that he was speaking to knew how critically important they were. They were two masterpieces from the Uffizi Museum. Uh, this painting belongs to the Pitti Palace in, in Florence. And um, he contacted officials and ultimately this guy had to fork over the pictures that uh, he'd, he'd taken. Uh, this is the General of the Carabinieri, uh, Fabrizio Parulli, who runs their Monuments Men equivalent and the director of the Uffizi, uh, Eric Schmidt and our uh, return there. So this painting that surfaced was one of the last of the 10 that went missing. There's still a couple more. And it was in the possession of a German, the family uh, of a German soldier that had bought it from one of the guys that took it. And um, we knew where it was. It was just a matter of trying to get it out of the family and back to the museum. And it was a glorious moment to see it unveiled there at the uh, Pitti Palace and uh, walk down the hallway and hang it back on the wall where it belonged. Well, and you never know where some of these may be in others' attics or basements. Um, and if you are interested, anyone who's watching, um, please make sure you go to the website to check out the photos of the most wanted items. And, you know, we would love to see them return. Uh, uh, so look, a lot of these things were in Texas. Uh, veterans came back that uh, people lived in the Northeast and they trained at bases in the United, in uh, Texas. And so when they retired, People moved to San Antonio, they moved to New Braunfels, they moved to Frisco, they moved to Dallas because the weather was really nice. And so mm -hmm. I, I've had people sometimes say, why is it so many of the things you found have come from people in Texas? What is it about Texans stealing stuff? And I said, you yeah, know, no, Texans <laughs> observe the law like everybody else does. <laughs> it's just that our weather is so nice. We had people from everywhere in the country come live here and they brought their artifacts and souvenirs and people from Europe that came to the United States immigrated to our parts of the world. So they're not all here. But uh, the strangest things show up in the strangest places, as you mentioned. And I have no doubt that there are more things in the Dallas-Fort Worth area that are important, that have a, a proper home in Europe. And we hope people that suspect they might have something like that will um, set the example and come forward and contact us. Yes, definitely. Well, I wanted to ask a question that kind of steps back a bit um, on the importance and value of art, because you know, even at the end of the movie, I was really struck by the question, was it worth it? And they don't even answer it because they want you to think about it, which um, I thought was brilliant. But we have that struggle right now um, with budgets being slashed and the arts 
typically ends up at the at the bottom. Um, what do you say to those who say that this mission was not important or that art is not valuable? Uh, well, we could talk for hours about this, but I think everyone, especially in these times today where we haven't been able to go to museums, is anybody happier because we haven't had any sporting events? Anybody happier because we haven't had any music concerts or because they can't go to an art museum? I don't think so. I mean, I think everyone's longing to get out and do those things. They've started now. Social distancing is still important, masks and so on. But these things define who we are as a civilization. And if we don't have them, we're, we're a lesser society. Um, we we uh, watch in horror today, ISIS, Al-Qaeda, um, in Bosnia-Herzegovina in the early 1990s, works of art are always the first target of the bad guys. And the reason is they want to destroy what people believe in. They don't kill people at the beginning. The Nazis didn't start off murdering Jews. They incarcerated them because the part of the Holocaust, whether it's a capital H or little h, but certainly uh, the, the, uh, the deliberate genocides, it always begins with humiliation. We're going to capture you and incarcerate you and keep you alive like a cat does a snake tossing it in the air while you, wa while you have to watch us gather the things that define you as a civilization and destroy them. We want you to see us burn them. We want you to see us uh, build bonfires with them. We're gonna destroy your literature, your churches, your mosques, your synagogues, whatever it is. And it takes place as recently as today, it's still happening in, in Mali and in Africa, in, um, certainly in Syria and so on. And so we get advance notice. We get an email from the bad guys before they come do this stuff. When they start destroying these things, what's getting ready to happen is people are going to be murdered in large quantities. And it happened in Nazi Germany, it happened in Bosnia Herzegovina, it happened in, with the bombing on Buddhas, in Afghanistan, it happened with Al Qaeda and and uh, ISIS going into Syria and other areas. It always happens this way, but we don't pay attention to it. And then we're asking questions about, well, what do we do now that the bad guys are in a place like Palmyra in Syria? It's the wrong question. By the time they're there, they're going to decide what they're going to do. There's nothing we can do about it. We have to be planning in advance to try and protect these things. So, does art matter? I mean, does oxygen matter? What's the value of oxygen? We breathe it every day. We kind of consider it's, you know, it's there, but we realize how important it is. I think arts are the same way. I mean, if I were uh, running Frisco, which I'm not, I'm sure there's a lot of gifted, talented people doing that. I wouldn't cut the arts out there. I'd increase them. You want to make a statement to cities around the country that gets visibility, make a statement about how important the arts are. Frisco certainly done it with respect to sports and that's a great thing, but there's nothing that brings people together and allows us to ignore all the things that create differences among us, more so than sports, music, and the arts. They're the three things that when we're at a U2 concert, we don't care about the person next to us being Democrat, Republican, Jew, Christian, black, white. We just want to hear Bono knock it out for two hours. The same is true at a sporting <laughs> event, same is true when we go to a music concert. So these things, uh, when people argue, well, they don't have a value, you're right, they're priceless. You can't put a value on the arts until you don't have them. And, you know, I was looking at a, a comment, someone that was, uh, that suffered immensely, that testified at the UN uh, War Crime Tribunal in 1992 to 95, uh, or, or as a consequence of the Bosnian War, that was utter devastation in that country. Cultural targets were, were cultural treasures were targeted. Um, uh, mosques and churches were, were destroyed deliberately, works of art and so on, and horrific loss of life. And yet a person said, and I quote, we get used to being killed. We know that human life is no more tangible or permanent than the life of a butterfly. But we see these other buildings and monuments being destroyed we see the rest of the world crumble around us and we become lost. So, you know, we're in a wealthy country and certainly in a wealthy part of the country and we can be prone to take these things for granted. So take it from people that are 
living in a much more harsh environment who don't have hardly anything. And yet the thing that they treasure are the things that have defined who they are as a people. And those are the things they risk their lives to try and save and preserve. And I think they have the same type value to us. It's just that we're a much younger country and the things that are our cultural treasures that are American made tend to be more ephemeral like ideas such as the constitution. Um, a flag of course um, engenders that kind of, our, our flag engenders that kind of commitment on everybody's part. So we tend to look at works of art a little bit differently, but they're of, of immense value to us and the arts in general are an engine that are not only economically successful and proven so, but they provide, they remind us of uh, things that are bigger than we are. And that gives us a sense of hope, especially during challenging times like these. Thank you for that. So well said. Uh, and we had some comments come in while you were championing the arts. Scott Dillingham says that uh, w when he listened to you at another um, lecture that you had mentioned, uh, a quote you saw carved in a stone entrance at a Budapest museum that said, Ars longa vita brevis, which is art is forever, life is short. Uh, and several people were just, you know, cheering on, uh, you're championing the arts for us. Thank you for that. Uh, I want to ask you now maybe a little more personal question because you have had so many different um, journeys really in your life um, that have now culminated into being an author and traveling and, and researching full time and enjoying that. But um, as you look back at, you know, being a pro tennis player and then an, a business guy and, and New York Times bestselling author, what would your current self tell your younger self and why? Uh, I probably underestimated the importance of networking. Um, I always understood, you know, be careful with ladders because the, you know, if you step on fingers going up, they're the same fingers you oftentimes pass going down. So I was pretty good in that area, but I, I have gotten involved in each of the things that I've done. The passion has taken me there. If there's a commonality of the things that I've done, it's that I knew nothing about any of it till I got involved in it. I just got interested and curious whether it was the playing tennis or the oil and gas exploration business or certainly writing, film production and so on. I ask a zillion questions and they start off, uh, some of them start off kind of dumb, uh, uninformed, but they get better. And uh, mm -hmm. I've been fortunate to surround myself with some great people who've been patient and, and holding my hand and making sure I, I learn the ropes. And I, I've always embraced hard work and that's a critical component. But, um, you know, curiosity is a, a big part of it. And I, you know, it's so easy to go back and tinker with things. I wish I'd done this. I wish I'd done that. But at 63 years old, as I look back and think about the impact that my life has had on a lot of people, um, as they tell me, the, the kids of the Monuments Men, family members, and certainly the Monuments Men and Women themselves, um, there's nothing I'm more pleased about and proud about than um, the happiness that it's brought these people late in their lives, something to look forward to, which is a rare thing for people as they get older. Um, so many of them are are facing uh, injuries and illnesses. They've lost important loved ones. They'll lose more. And, you know, it's a, my dad used to say jokingly, but he was, he was meant it seriously. Uh, old age is not for sissies. And um, mm -hmm. it does take a lot of courage going forward doing it and the chance to have something to look forward to, the chance to be celebrated for something that they've done and recognized and thanked by people has meant uh, added years to their life. And to be a part of that, I mean, we've got a great team of people that have helped me be the voice of this, but to, to see that happen it's, a, it's the blessing of a lifetime and it's certainly made me a better person. So. Um, there are things I can see that I should have done better or that I could have done, but um, I'm certainly incredibly grateful, incredibly grateful for how it's all evolved. Mm -hmm. Well, following your passion, I mean, that's uh, one thing that I see that 
you know, you really can't fail at that because it is what you want to do and you're going to do it whether you get paid or not. It's just what you want to do. It's where your heart is. So I'm so thankful that we have had um, someone like you taking on this passion of sharing the story of these monuments, men and women. And as you said, um, honoring them. We have one of the granddaughters of George Stout is watching and um, said hello, Leslie. Uh, now for our last question before we wrap up, um, what is next on the horizon for you? Uh, are you working on some other major projects? Uh, yes, yes. There are two books I'm working on. Uh, one involves uh, Monuments Women. Uh, the, um, they're both incredibly moving, dramatic stories, uh, factually based, and um, things I've had a strong interest in for years that um, they're time consuming, but they're great stories. I think they will be films, great films. We're working on a film of Saving Italy, which is the, the uh, story of what the Monuments Men did in Italy. That's in a very, very different story, a different uh, cast of Monuments officers, a different cast of bad guys, not just Hitler and Goering, uh, but a remarkable twist that I think will be uh, more of a Netflix type project because it's so intricate and um, just filled with uh, really unbelievable moments that we need more time than a two hour feature film can can uh, squeeze all these things into. And then of course I speak a lot to whether it's veterans organizations or traveling around the country, speaking to schools, universities, talking about the monuments, men and women. And I've got uh, two little boys at home, one that's two and one that's three and a half that um, thank God my wife who's a, who runs the foundation, but has got Job's patience and spends more time the, with them than I do. But I spend a lot of time with them and they are uh, of course, not in school right now and uh, running mm -hmm. up and down the hall, the small halls of our house. And we have a blast with them. And they are, uh, as Chris Rock would say, they keep it real. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, thank you for keeping it real with us today. Uh, we also have a couple more comments. Um, well, to learn more about your books, we can go to robertedsel.com. Uh, and if uh, anyone's interested in learning more about the Monuments, Mount, uh, Monuments Men Foundation, please visit the website uh, and you can see those numbers there as well. Uh, if you have something that yep. you think matches, uh, that would be great. Well, uh, Robert, thank you so much for sharing your heart with us and um, the incredible work you, that you're doing. We just so appreciate um, all, all of it. Thank you. Thank you, Tammy, very much. Well, that's going to wrap it up for our Smart Men Spotlight. Um, it was so much wonderful, interesting information. I feel like I have to actually watch the show again so that I can digest it all. But I hope you all had a great time um, learning and listening today about this, the, the greatest art heist of all time and continues to be the, the greatest art hunt um, of all time. So we hope that... Uh, you were inspired and as Robert said, you know, stay curious, follow your passion and absolutely, absolutely, um, you know, let's champion the arts. We need it here in Frisco. So we'll see you next time. Thank you all.